friends, I'm Jeffrey Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and welcome to We the People, a weekly show of constitutional debate. The National Constitution Center is a nonpartisan nonprofit chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. In this episode, we're sharing a recent conversation about David Hume and his influence on the founders and on the Constitution. It was so great to be joined by a Hume dream team, three great Hume scholars, Aaron Zubia, Angela Coventry, and Dennis Rasmussen. We discussed Hume's philosophical legacy and its impact on America. Enjoy the show. Hello, friends. Welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Before we start, let's inspire ourselves, as always, for the light and learning ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the U.S. Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. We have some great programs coming up in February. This Thursday, February 1st, we're going to Phoenix and to Arizona State University to reconvene the Constitution Drafting Project. Remember that wonderful project convening three teams, Libertarian, Progressive, and Conservative, who agreed on five proposed amendments to the Constitution? Well, we're taking the show on the road and we'll be in Phoenix on Thursday. Uh, On February 15th, we'll celebrate Black History Month with uh, historians Etta Fields Black and James Oakes. And then on President's Day, February 19th, I'm so excited that we're launching my new book, The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. It'll be live at the NCC. Jeffrey Goldberg from The Atlantic is coming to Philly to for a conversation about the book. I'm so excited. If you can make it live, come and I'll uh, say hi in person. And if not, please tune in online. Uh, It is now a great honor to introduce the dream team of Hume scholars. The great David Hume, who had such an influence on the founding, uh, is a central character in in my happiness book. And I can't wait to learn from America's experts on Hume about how, who he was and how he influenced the founding. Angela Coventry is professor of philosophy at Portland State University. She's the author of Hume's Theory of Causation, a quasi-realist interpretation, Hume, a guide for the perplexed, co-editor of David Hume, Morals, Politics, and Society, and the Humean Mind, and co-author of the Historical Dictionary of Hume's Philosophy, and she's uh, published a special edition of Hume's Treatise of Human Nature. Can't wait to learn from her. Dennis Rasmussen is professor of political science and the Haggerty Family Fellow at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. He's the author of five magnificent books, including The Infidel and the Professor, David Hume, Adam Smith, and the Friendship that Shaped Modern Thought, Fears of a Setting Sun, The Disillusionment of America's Founders, which I rely on and learn so much from, and most recently, The Constitution's Penman, Governor Morris, and the Creation of America's Basic Charter. And Aaron Alexander Zubia is Assistant Professor of Humanities at the University of Florida. His work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, National Review, Law and Liberty, and Hume Studies. And his new book is The Political Thought of David Hume, The Origins of Liberalism, and the Modern Political Imagination. Thank you so much for joining Angela Coventry, Dennis Rasmussen, and Aaron Alexander Zubia. I'll kick us off by saying that, as I mentioned, Hume was a central character for me in the happiness book, I sent out to read the books on Thomas Jefferson's reading list that he said were key to understanding uh, the pursuit of happiness. And Hume's essays are on the list, along with Stoic uh, and Enlightenment moral philosophers. And when I read Hume's essays, I was struck that he twice uses the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. He writes in his uh, essay, about uh, the Stoics, it's not true that every man, however dissolute and negligent, proceeds unerringly in the pursuit of happiness. Even the most polished citizen is inferior to the man of virtue, and the true philosopher who governs his appetites, subdues his passions, and has learned from reason to set a just value on every pursuit and enjoyment. And that phrase by Hume sums up the classical understanding of the pursuit of happiness, not 
feeling good, but being good, not the pursuit of virtue, but the, not the pursuit of pleasure, but the pursuit of virtue. And Humes defines virtue as subduing your passions, governing your appetites, and learning from reason to set a just value on every pursuit and enjoyment. So with that introduction, Dennis Rasmussen, I'll begin by asking you to kick us off to tell us a little more about who Hume was and why he was so influential on the founders. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for putting this uh, discussion together. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Hume is widely seen as probably the greatest philosopher to ever write in the English language, or maybe second to Thomas Hobbes, depending on who you ask. Um, he's also, I think it's fair to say, among the most loved of philosophers. There was a, recently a survey of thousands of academic philosophers around the world that found that more identified themselves with Hume than with any other figure in the history of philosophy. Um, that's partly, I think, it, maybe as much due to his personality as, as due to his thought. He seems to have been one of the best-natured philosophers who ever lived. Um, during his time, he spent some time in Paris, and he was almost universally known there as Le Bon David, the good David. So he's this, you know, rotund, affable guy. He's fond of food and drink and games. His favorite game was whist. Um, he loved good company. Um, and he's so kind of open and kindly and cheerful that many people who were uh, sort of scandalized by his writings were disarmed when they met him in person. So he seems to be a very likable guy. Um, in terms of his, his philosophy or his outlook, it's very hard to summarize. He wrote so much about so many topics. Um, he's an interesting figure insofar as he's quite highly critical of religion, almost all forms of religion, but he's also quite skeptical about the capacities of human reason. Um, politically speaking, he certainly welcomes what he sees as the blessings of progress and civilization. Um, he's, I think it's fair to say, a liberal in the broadest sense of the term, meaning that he stresses the benefits of limited government and individual liberty, religious toleration, private property, commerce, and the like. But he's a sort of skeptical liberal. Um, he's a skeptical not just in his epistemology, but also in his politics, in the sense that he distrusts big, sudden innovations in politics. He thinks that, you know, given the fallibility of human reason, given the, the kind of complicated, uh, variable nature of the political world, we should be pretty uh, wary of grand schemes for reforming society. So he's skeptical with regard to the introduction of principle and ideology in, into politics um, in a way that a lot of his Enlightenment colleagues weren't. And so, yeah, he was just a, a, an enormously important and influential figure. And so it's not surprising that he had a, a big impact on the founders. Um, when I was kind of preparing for this discussion, I reread a little bit of Mark Spencer's book. A scholar named Mark Spencer wrote a really exhaustive book called David Hume in 18th Century America. Um, and looking through that again, it's remarkable how widely known, how widely read Hume's works were during the founding period, especially his, his he wrote a six volume, Hume wrote a six volume history of England and his essays, I think were the most read, most cited pieces um, by people on both sides of the political spectrum for a whole host of reasons. Um, it's not that we had a discussion about uh, Montesquieu, the great phil French philosopher Montesquieu uh, a few months ago. And there, you know, there are certain themes like the separation of powers that you can really point to and say, uh, you know, everybody zeroed in on the separation of powers. Hume's used for a bunch of different reasons by a bunch of different folks. Um, I'll, I guess I'll turn it over to, to maybe Angela and Aaron to talk about what some of those, those influences are. But that's hopefully a good general sense of Hume, who Hume was. Superb. Such a great introduction to Hume uh, noting his tremendous influence um, is, is quoted so often during the Constitutional Convention that people said that his works had been committed to memory. And as you note, among the most cited with Montesquieu, uh, Montesquieu is first and Hume is fourth, according to one scholar. And you so well sum up his liberalism and skepticism. Uh, Angela, what would you say about uh, why Hume was so influential to the founders? Well, everything that Dennis said is absolutely true and, and correct and beautifully put. Um, and definitely, you gave out that quote, he was the fourth most cited secular author in early America. So we know that everyone uh, is, re is reading him. Um, but I guess the thing I'd like to add on to, to Dennis's story is actually part of the reason I like him so much, 
is that Hume was very controversial during his lifetime. And I do think if you look at his influence on uh, early America, yes, some figures liked him, some didn't, <laughs> like, like Jefferson. Um, and so that's always kind of a, like an interest to me, like why was Hume so controversial? Now, obviously, um, when he was writing in Scotland, he was nearly excommunicated uh, for his um, philosophy. Uh, we know that he was denied academic jobs um, as well uh, because of his uh, philosophy. So we know that he was a very controversial figure. And, and even though today, as, as Dennis said, like we, he's generally regarded as one of the greatest philosophers to write in English. I mean, there's still plenty of controversy surrounding Hume's works, but I take it that today most of us scholars kind of disagree on what Hume was actually up to. Uh, so, and this spans pretty much everything that Hume wrote. So this is a huge discussion. Uh, but people wonder, is, is he just a destructive skeptic um, or, or is he really trying to build, you know, a science of the mind that would extend to a science of politics? Um, does he think there's a self? Is, is there no self? Is there a self? Is he a causal realist, anti-realist, moral realist? And so all of these kinds of disputes, I think, kind of arise uh, from Hume's philosophy and he can be appropriated from many, many many different angles. And I take it that is one of the attractions of Hume's view is that it is open to so many interpretations and we can see it being influential in so many uh, different topics. Um, so definitely I think we can see that Madison uh, was influenced by Hume um, and we can definitely say that Hamilton definitely influenced by Hume, experimental politics and so on. Um, but if you look at someone like Jefferson, he was not a fan of Hume um, at all and had as very harsh things um, to say. Also some nice things too. He did say some nice things about Hume's style, um, but he also called him some, some, some not nice things and Adams uh, seemed to agree with him. So basically what I'm trying to say, it should be no surprise um, that Hume's legacy in thinking about early America is somewhat mixed uh, as well. Um, so to get to a Whig versus Tory dispute <laughs> is, is going to happen pretty quickly with Jefferson um, and Adams. Great. S such a uh, powerful reminder of the fact that despite his uh, wide appeal, some liked him and others didn't. And you note that Whig Tory split. And indeed, as you suggest, Jefferson didn't like him because he called him a honeyed Tory and thought his history of England was uh, pro-monarch, and uh, uh, by contrast, uh, Hamilton and the um, Federalists embraced him more as a model because of his strong visions of executive power. We'll dig into those influences uh, in a moment, but uh, before we do, Aaron, uh, give, give us your overview sense of why and in what ways Hume was so influential on the founding generation. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. And it's uh, an honor to be here with Dennis and Angela. Uh, Hume, born 1711, died 1776, was, after Montesquieu's death, the leading man of letters uh, in Britain and on the continent. So it's very fitting, Jeff, that you've had uh, two sessions, one on Montesquieu and one on Hume, uh, this one here. Um, very fitting. And uh, in, you know, in connection with your uh, book on happiness, uh, Hume was interested in the happiness of, of mankind. That's uh, what the first reviewer of he book three of Hume's treatise of human nature said. So Hume around the time he's 18 comes up with an idea, uh, it takes him 10 years to execute it, to write this uh, dense uh, philosophical treatise called the treatise of human nature. Book one is called of the understanding, book two of the passions and book three of morals. So that came out in 1740. And the first reviewer said, this author is interested in the happiness of mankind and wants, he intends to be heard by everybody. And he wants to reach ordinary readers. And he also wants to reform practically all the opinions of mankind is what this reviewer said. But this reviewer and Hume himself recognized that Hume didn't succeed in doing that when he wrote uh, the treatise. It was a dense work, a thick work that uh, Hume in his autobiography said, fell dead born from the press. And so shortly after the treatise, Hume started uh, translating his own philosophy into uh, shorter pieces, uh, more digestible, uh, pithier essays. 
And so he had two volumes of essays come out in the 1740s on moral, literary, and political topics. He had a best-selling uh, collection of essays, The Political Discourses, which came out in 1752. And as Dennis mentioned, from 1754 to 1762, his six-volume History of England was released. So while Angela mentioned all the controversy about Hume's philosophy and so much contemporary of uh, work on Hume, deals with his treatise. At the time, in the 18th century, he was known primarily as uh, an essayist and a historian. And he was almost impossible to ignore. Uh, Dennis and Angela have mentioned his controversial uh, aspects. And uh, as an example of this, uh, Timothy Dwight, who was Jonathan Edwards' grandson, he was named president of Yale College in 1795. And one of his first addresses was uh, essentially a plea to save students from falling for Hume's irreligious and libertine uh, views, which testifies to the fact that Hume was being read. He was being read um, frequently. And it wasn't just in America. There was an Italian priest who noted that even though uh, some of Hume's more controversial works uh, about religion, especially, were on the index of forbidden books, yet everybody in Rome seemed to be uh, reading them. He said it's as if Hume cast a magic spell on his readers, and he managed to be read while his critics and detractors uh, were not read. And so in these essays, you know, Hume is speaking to, writing to polite society. He's also writing to statesmen to teach about cause and effect in political affairs. And uh, two of the statesmen that, that read uh, Hume and applied some of those insights, of course, are, are Hume and Madison, and uh, we'll, we'll get into that soon, I'm sure. Superb. He does cast a kind of magic spell, as you so well put it, because the essays are so clear, and it's so interesting to learn from you that they were intended as popular distillations of the moral philosophy that he set out at greater length in the three volumes of the treatise of human nature, and also so interesting that those three volumes were about the understanding, the passions or emotions, and morals. Um, great. Well, let's now dig into his most famous influence on the founders, and that is on Madison in Federalist 10. The scholar Douglas Adair famously noted uh, decades ago that Madison's thinking about factions were especially influenced by Hume's essay idea of a perfect commonwealth. Dennis uh, Rasmussen, tell us, first of all, how Madison defined factions and how his ideas were influenced by Hume. Sure. So we sometimes use the word faction to mean more or less party. Um, Madison defines a faction as a group that is pursuing some end that is detrimental either to the rights of other citizens or to what he calls the permanent and aggregate interests of the community, meaning the common good. So a faction is by definition a negative group for, for Madison. Um, and of course, the, the main burden of Federalist 10 is to show that only a large republic can adequately deal with the problem of majority faction. And I think the two main sources uh, for, for this idea for Madison are David Hume and his best friend, Adam Smith. Um, so you kindly mentioned the, the book I wrote on, on Hume and Smith's friendship. They were best friends for their entire adult lives, which is this is an amazing thing, right? Hume is um, again, this great philosopher, Smith is maybe the history's most famous theorist of commercial society. Um, both kind of prefig both Hume and Smith prefigured Madison's argument in Federalist 10. Smith in a, 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 The Wealth of Nations makes a similar argument about religious sects. But since this, Hume, this, this uh, discussion centers on Hume, let me talk about how Hume prefigures this argument uh, of Madison's. So the Hume makes this argument very briefly. It's in an essay called Idea of a Perfect Commonwealth which is a sort of uh, curious or unusual essay within Hume's corpus, insofar as he's usually quite averse to the idea of striving for perfection in politics. Um, but the key part for our purposes is just really a very short part. The second to last paragraph of the essay um, is almost a, a precy, a su good summary of, of Ma Madison's argument in Federalist 10. So in this paragraph, Hume argues in favor of the feasibility of a large republic. That is to say, a Republican government that would work in a big country like Britain or France in, in his time that had previously been thought to be impossible, right? Um, the, so before Hume's essay, people had always assumed that republics are only feasible within small territories, small populations, something on the level of a Swiss canton or a Greek city-state or, or Italian city-state. The idea being 
well, if the people are going to govern themselves or even choose their representatives well, then there can't be too many people. They can't be too spread out. Um, if they are, then they, you know, they won't form a close-knit community. They'll have different interests, different opinions. They'll split into groups, factions, tear each other apart. And Hume is maybe the first figure in the whole Western tradition to argue that um, the contrary is true, that republics could work even better on a large scale than they would on a small scale. Why? He said, well, small republics are susceptible to the, the kind of changing whims of the people. Um, they're susceptible to what Madison would call majority faction, where the majority uh, combines to oppress individuals, to oppress minorities. Whereas in a big, diverse republic, representatives can, as he puts it, refine. Madison would use the term, same term, refine people's views, their desires. That is to say, correct for people's passions, their, their irrationality. Um, and that is good that it's the, the people are, you know, there are more people, they're more spread out. That makes it harder for them to combine to uh, enact oppressive measures if there's a, a majority faction in the country. Um, so this is, again, Madison's argument in Federalist 10 in a nutshell. Madison spells out things at much greater length than Hume does. Again, it's just this one paragraph of this one essay. But in terms of purely practical impact, that might be the single most influential paragraph Hume ever wrote. Um, to just the way it influenced Madison and thus the whole American experiment. Beautifully distilled uh, for just the reasons you say. In Hume's view, uh, quoting from the essay that you cited, idea of a perfect commonwealth, republics in large territories are more difficult to form and once established, they're less susceptible to tumult and faction. The various parts of the large republic are so distant and remote that it would be very difficult for factions to use intrigue, prejudice, or passion to hurry the representatives into any measures against the public interest. And that's the sentence that Madison, as you say, distilled into his famous sentence about how in an extended republic, it's less likely that a majority will invade minority rights or uh, to actually coordinate action if they discover their strength. Um, Angela, uh, more, of course, about yeah. what, what Madison took from Hume and then maybe introduce differences between Madison's notion of faction and Hume's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's kind of actually, it was great to hear uh, Dennis's summary, right, of Madison on factions. Um, and I think one of the things that I would add to that is that both Hume and Madison seem to think that factions are inevitable and they're going to happen. Um, so, and this is probably just due to human nature. Um, but I think also, you know, if you're, if you've got people that have different interests and different passions, uh, different levels of wealth, um, as well, <laughs> um, different amounts of property, uh, what you're going to find is people are going to group together between th those who are most similar to them. And I think Hume thought that that could be a threat, like it could lead to the dismantling of, of government, um, it could lead to violence, and these are things that, that Hume definitely thought that the government should be able to control, and that seems to be when Madison starts. He says, you know, a well-functioning government should be able to <laughs> um, stop the violence of factions. Uh, so, so very kind of clear uh, cut, I think, similarity in that this is something that is inevitable in society. And so that means if we're going to talk about how we ought to be governed, then we have to talk about, well, how are we actually going to deal uh, with, with something like factions? Um, now, as you said, M Madison thought that we could manage it by getting bigger. <laughs> he seems to have uh, gotten that from Hume. So the more diverse groups we have, the more people interests are out there, it's going to be the case that uh, no one group can dominate uh, the other. Um, so, so I take it that for, for both of them, faction is absolutely central for uh, any kind of well-governed union, um, but it's something that has to be taken seriously because it's just going to be something that happens when you have groups of people together um, because we're together in a society, Hume says, you know, we're dependent upon each other. <laughs> um, so we have to learn how best to live with each other. So making sure that no one group can threaten the rights or the well-being of community is of absolute importance. And that's what I love about Madison's uh, number 10 is that he starts 
right there. Like this is like so if we're going to be well governed, we have to start uh, with this. Um, so I think he was also worried about religious factions as well as political ones. But <laughs> um, Madison is focused uh, on, on political ones. But notice that they both think that that factions in moderation are okay, and it's you know it's it's okay to have moderate party affiliation, that's not a detriment um, at all. Um, in fact, I think Hume says at one point part of the English constitution, the upshot of that is that, yeah, you're going to have moderate factions. That will come out of it. But the question arises, well, what do we do to curb that, <laughs> um, the extreme factions? Because Hume definitely wasn't a fan of extreme factions um, because violence, um, threaten, disruption, society. And I think as Hume says once, you know, we kind of like society, we want it to continue. Uh, so we want to make sure if we're going to be governed well, that we have the right kind of measures in place to make sure that um, factions can't, you know, uh, infringe on others and also, you know, threaten the well-being of society. Um, now differences, um, well, I guess Madison really... Uh, what he does is gives a, like a, a beautiful solution based on him looking at the current state of American politics. So and so that obviously Hume didn't have that. <laughs> um, so but Madison is kind of like he's taking what Hume's doing an idea of a perfect commonwealth and he is applying it. But not it's not like he takes a utopia from Hume. Obviously, I think as Dennis mentioned, there's no utopia. There's no perfect government. Um, that that's just you know, that's a fiction. Even the best government is going to have weaknesses. Just like any system of justice, there's going to be injustice. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I think Matt, what I like about uh, Madison is that he thinks we can actually build the stability and stop the... I have lost you and I'm going to Check my... Dennis or Aaron, do you want to pick up where uh, Angela left off while we wait for her and Jeff to return? Yeah, sure thing. So... Madison opens Federalist 10, writing that uh, a well-constructed union will be able to uh, break or at least, uh, if, if not cure, at least mitigate the, the main mischiefs of, of faction. And uh, right there with this phrase, well-constructed union, we see that Madison is employing this new science of politics uh, that Hume uh, developed, which is focused on institutions more than the character of the people uh, leading more than the character of the governors, right? It's what kind of institutions can we create uh, to ensure uh, safety and promote uh, public happiness? And so um, Madison, I think, is building on what Hume wrote and that politics may be reduced to a science where he's uh, concerned with taking human beings uh, not as we wish them to be, uh, but taking them as they are. And uh, for Hume, in, in an essay called uh, Of the Dignity or Meanness of Human Nature, uh, he emphasizes uh, both the highs and the lows of, of human nature. So um, if you look at the human person and, and uh, uh, compare the human person to other animals, well, you know, we come out uh, looking quite good, um, quite uh, noble. You know, there's uh, per uh, perhaps a divine part of us, the, the rational part that is capable of uh, categorizing, of foreseeing things, planning, uh, executing uh, those plans. Uh, but if you look at the angelic uh, realm and compare the human person, person to angelic beings, well, we, we look uh, quite depraved. And Hume had a Calvinist upbringing, so he knew a good bit about human depravity. And similar, uh, similarly with, with Madison, I mean, he says in Federalist 63 that reason, truth, and justice should be the authorities of our public deliberation, but that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes partial interests will arise, sometimes uh, partial loves will predominate, and that's, that's when faction occurs. So for uh, for Hume, faction is not necessarily a bad thing. There are certain bad kinds of, of faction. Uh, Hume thinks that the modern world is unique and that there are factions based on uh, speculative first principles. So the Whigs of his day uh, uh, based uh, their, their partisan uh, proposals based on the theory of the original contract, whereas Tories uh, developed their proposals in line with the uh, theory of the divine right of kings. And Hume thinks it's a bad idea to debate these moral first principles in public life. But uh, 
for Hume, economic interests are most excusable because these are, as Madison would say, sown into the nature of man. And so these are the things that we need to deal with. Either you're going to extinguish liberty, but that's not desirable. Uh, so the next best thing is to check uh, the mischiefs of faction, and, and that's by limiting power where uh, it needs to be limited and balancing various interests so that no single one predominates. So Madison says there are various faculties, various opinions are going to form, uh, various uh, levels of, of property will be attained, there will be mercantile interests, um, there will be landed interests, moneyed interests, and uh, what we need to do is recognizing the depravity of the human person, recognizing, as Madison said, that enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. How are we going to uh, limit you know, these factions, which are so pernicious, and how are we going to limit them and prevent them from uh, taking us away from deliberation over uh, about the general good? Superb. Um, I, I'm back. Forgive me for having dropped off because of a Wi-Fi issue, but uh, no need for me in this great conversation, which is moderating itself. And you so well introduced the connection between Hume's pessimistic view of human nature and his solutions to the problem of faction, which Madison channeled, as you said, both uh, first representation and second, the separation of powers are Madison's human solutions to the problem of faction. Let's now put Hamilton on the table. And since uh, Aaron, you, you introduced his idea of human nature, um, focus on this famous phrase uh, of Hume's, every man must be supposed a knave, which Hamilton embraced in 1775 in an early stage in his political career. He wrote an essay called The Continentalist, uh, which set forth the relevance of Hume for the revolution. And broadly, Hamilton embraced Hume's idea that we're motivated by private interests, not public interest, and the goal of government is not to eliminate self-interest, but to harness it to make it cooperate in the public good, notwithstanding his insatiable avarice and ambition. This introduces the central question of Hume's notion of virtue. And while classical philosophers said you could only have a republic when virtuous citizens use their powers of reason, Hume disagrees and says reason is and ought to be the slave of passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. And Hume argues that self-interest can actually serve the public good and profit maximizing commerce can increase the prosperity of all. All right, Dennis, how did I do with that? That's just a stab at the summary of the connection between Hume's views on human nature and his, uh, and his views of commerce and uh, tell us more about that and how they influenced Hamilton. Yeah, no, that was an excellent introduction. Um, I, I do think that's one of the biggest things that put Hume on the side of, say, Hamilton and uh, against the side of Jefferson is his extraordinarily welcoming attitude toward commerce and commercial society, even much more so than, than Adam Smith, who's much more famous as a, a proponent of commerce and commercial society. Um, so let me maybe just back up and, and talk about Hume's attitude toward commerce, um, and, and maybe even the situation in which he made this, uh, or gave his arguments, because two of the most um, venerable traditions of Western thought up to that time, namely civic republicanism and Christianity, tended to regard commerce and wealth and luxury, all the things that went with commerce, as inherently corrupting. That They saw commerce as a threat to public order, to political liberty, to virtue, to salvation, and you know, Hume comes in and says, commerce is good. There's nothing particularly noble or redeeming about poverty. There's nothing intrinsically objectionable about luxury. Um, for me, the key essay in, in this regard is uh, an essay, it was first titled Of Luxury and later retitled Of Refinement in the, of the Arts. I read this as one of the most forceful and comprehensive yet succinct defenses of the whole modern liberal commercial order that's ever been written. It's only maybe 12 pages long. It's amazing how much ground he covers in this essay. He, Hume argues that progress in the arts and sciences and commerce and the like lead to what he calls an indissoluble chain of industry, knowledge, and humanity, as well as liberty, he adds later in the essay. And so here he's very much on the opposite side of someone like his contemporary Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, Hume had a very famous personal quarrel with Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau was, you know, thought commerce and civilization, the, the whole 
complex of things that went by the name of progress at the time, you know, made people uh, vicious and miserable. Hume thought they did the opposite. Hume thought that uh, commerce, the whole process of civilization makes us happier, makes us more virtuous. They make society not just richer, but freer, more stable, more orderly, more moderate, more humane. Um, he uh, wrote quite a bit on what was then called political economy. He takes a very cosmopolitan view insofar as, you know, most of the economic tracts of the day are set, setting out to say, well, how might we advance Britain's trading interests or what came to be seen as basically the, what amounted to the same thing in most eyes is how can we harm France's trading interests? Hume, you know, looks at this with a much broader view, the eye of a philosopher or a historian, let's rise above petty national prejudices and animosities. How can, you know, commerce can free trade, he thought can promote the interests of all. Um, so here, I mean, he's writing before Smith's Wealth of Nations and he's anticipating a lot of Smith's arguments about, you know, what's the true source of a nation's wealth? It's not gold or silver or a positive balance of trade, as those known as the mercantilists advocated. Rather, it's a productive citizenry. Um, he argued that most attempts by politicians to guide or control people's economic choices are at best futile, at worst positively counterproductive, that free trade benefits everyone, city, country, rich, poor, government, populace, everybody benefits. Yeah, so he, he's anticipating a lot of Smith's arguments in The Wealth of Nations. So, uh, you know, I think that's a big part of why someone like Hamilton or, or uh, Hamilton's good friend, Governor Morris, what, what they found so attractive in Hume is he, he has such an overwhelmingly positive view of, of commerce and its, its social and political effects. Superb. Such a great introduction of the centrality of commerce and why, as you said, that welcoming view would naturally make him a favorite of Hamilton and not of Jefferson, who, of course, suspects uh, ha Hamilton's ur urban preference for financiers and exalts agrarian virtue. Angela, tell us more about that dichotomy you flagged about the fact that Hamilton mistrusted Hume and, uh, and, and, and Hamilton liked him. And what it, it affected their views of English history. Hume wrote a history of England that Jefferson considered such a locus of honeyed Toryism that he would insist on bodlerized or edited versions before they were safe to be read by law students because it was so... Uh, Tory-like. And what was it that made Hume a favorite of conservatives beyond his embrace of commerce and made Jefferson so mistrusted? She may have had the same Wi-Fi issues I did. So if, if I may, Aaron, might I uh, ask you to take that one up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, um, uh, you mentioned this quote, uh, you know, treating everyone as if, uh, he were a knave and thinking just a little bit more of about faction uh i mean hume uh was a moral sentimentalist so we have uh feelings of of praise and and blame and one thing about a faction is that it disrupts uh the operation of the sentiments so that uh we we judge what is good and bad based on partial interest rather than the public interest so um, Hume did think that there was a redeeming quality to economic self-interest is that, you know, you display uh, industry and uh, frugality and discipline and uh, create products that other people want. You're going to contribute to the increasing uh, prosperity of your uh, community. And uh, Dennis mentioned of refinement in the arts that uh, great Hume essay uh, that really is, as Dennis said, a uh, distillation of the modern uh, commercial uh, spirit. And that's what uh, Hamilton cites in Federalist 85 when he describes Hume as a solid and ingenious writer. And Hamilton is the only one who refers to the United States as a commercial nation. And he does that in, Fe uh, in Federalist 6. And this, too, is uh, evidence of his reliance on Hume's uh, theory of uh advancement, advancement in the mechanical arts, uh, leads to advancement in the liberal arts, material welfare, increasing material welfare leads to the improvement of morals. And so Hume is, is a key theorist there. And, and Hamilton, uh, was, was definitely a, uh, uh, attentive, uh, to Hume's theory there. 
And one thing, I mean, adding to this conflict between Hamilton and Jefferson, uh, Hume was a defender of authority to a certain degree. In uh, one essay, he says that uh, in every government, there's a perpetual conflict between liberty and authority. And he says, although uh, civil liberty is the perfection of, of government, uh, authority is necessary to its existence. And so in his history of England, as you mentioned, uh, Hume uh, refers to uh, the modern period beginning with the Tudors as when really useful uh, history begins. And we can start learning from how the centralization uh, of the state uh, reduced the power of the barons and re reduced competing jurisdictions between the church and the barons uh, and the prince. And so you have uh, a centralized uh, monarchy that eventually gets limited. Uh, but that monarchy also, with Henry VIII, subordinates the church to its power. And then uh, not so much with Henry VII and Henry VIII, but uh, after them, Elizabeth and onward, uh, you find uh, the promotion of commerce. So Hume sees the role for uh, an energetic government, which is precisely what uh, the Federalist Party wanted uh, during the time of ratification. So uh, you could see how Jefferson, who is a decentralist, uh, would be somewhat uh, wary of Hume's writing, especially when, uh, as Hume said, when he was making, when he was amending the history of England, he made almost every change away from the Whig side and toward the Tory side. So especially as as, as Hume got older, he was more skeptical of, of cries for liberty, and he defended uh, the need for a strong authority in order to promote civilization and, uh, and, and, and peace in society. Great. That so well explains why he would appeal to Hamilton and not Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson sees an unalterable tension between liberty and power. Hamilton believes that power can reinforce uh, liberty in the, in, in, by, by increasing commerce and the well-being for all. And Hume would be a natural touchstone for Hamilton. And I, I know we've lost Angela, and she's still trying to get back with Wi-Fi. And as we're waiting, let's turn to uh, Federalist 85, um, Hamilton's discussion of executive power. He explicitly cites Hume. Dennis, he cites your favorite uh, piece, The Rise of Arts and Sciences, and talks about the need for an energetic executive. Describe Hume's influence on Hamilton in this Federalist piece. And, and broadly, why it was that Hamilton thought that Hume's defense of a strong monarch who was able to bring the House of Lords, uh, rather the House of Commons, over to his side by giving them offices and emoluments. Um, Hamilton thought you can call this corruption, but it's a good way of the executive defending its own interest against the incursions of Parliament. Jefferson took that out of context and said Hamilton was defending corruption. So give us a sense of all how that influenced Hamilton's Humean conception of executive power. Sure. Well, so first, uh, just a minor correction. So the, the Hume wrote two essays, one called Of the Rise in Progress in the Arts and Sciences, one called Of the of Refinement in the Arts. So I'd been referring to the, the latter. And, uh, Hamilton I was mistaken the there. Former. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so in this 85th and, and final paper of the Federalist is the only um, paper in the Federalist that um, Hamilton or Madison or Jay, for that matter, Publius, um, actually cites Hume. There's the, the clear allusion to Hume, I think, in Federalist 10, but he actually cites Hume in, in Federalist 85. He calls Hume a writer equally solid and ingenious. Um, so again, showing the sort of differences between Hamilton and Jefferson on the um, on their attitudes toward Hume. Although I, I, I guess I should say, I, I don't think it's been said. I think the younger Jefferson, in fact, admired Hume more than the later Jefferson did. It was really only later in his career that Jefferson came to see him as a Tory who ought to be avoided or shielded from, 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 from young students. Um, can I add one more thing that we haven't, we've been talking about Hume's impact on, on the founders. Um, Hume also himself talked about um, the march toward American independence. And I, I don't want to finish this discussion without at least touching on that. Um, so Hume dies in the autumn of 1776. So it's, of course, very early on in the movement toward independence. I think word of the Declaration of Independence didn't reach Scotland until just days before Hume's death. Um, and so Hume, he, Hume never published anything on the topic, but he did write quite a bit in his correspondence about American affairs. 
And I think it's very interesting. He was among the earliest and most consistent advocates of American independence in all of Britain. Almost everybody besides Hume and, again, his good friend Adam Smith um, advocated forceful measures to keep the colonies within the British fold and saw, saw the, the Americans as behaving re uh, really uh, terribly. Um, Hume and, again, Smith are basically the lone dissenters on the score. They both denounced the war. They denounced the policies, what they saw as the mercantilist policies that provoked it. Hume, in his uh, correspondence, as early as 1771. So this is way before almost any American had seriously contemplating severing ties with, with Britain, says basically the union with America can't last. There's just no, in the nature of things, there's no way this can last. When Boer breaks out in 1775, he immediately says, we should lay aside all anger, shake hands and part friends. Basically just let, let America go. Um, in fact, at one point he went so far as to declare, I'm an American in my principles and wish we would let them alone to govern or misgovern themselves as they think proper. Now, I think that's maybe a bit misleading for Hume to say he's an American in his principles. Um, I've already tried to suggest he really distrusts the in invocation of abstract principles in political life of the kind that the American revolutionaries love to appeal to, right? The self-evident truths and inalienable rights of the Declaration of Independence and the like. Really, his advocacy of American independence rested on pragmatic considerations and on what he thought would be best for Britain. He thought, you know, most British people were sure that the colonies were a, a, an important source of national wealth and power and the like. He thought they were a burden, an economic, political, military burden that basically both sides would be benefit if they just end the colonial relationship, set up a system of free trade um, and, and, you know, just part ways. So, um, he's not quite an American in his principles, I, I'm trying to suggest, but he was, I think, interestingly, one of the first and, and boldest advocates of American independence in, in all of Britain. Uh, powerful statement about I'm an American in my principles, but uh, more complicated for just the reasons that you say. Um, I should note that Angela's campus has lost internet. She's trying to get back, but we haven't gotten her back yet. Um, there are lots of great questions um, that have come through, and I'll, just a few um, that I'll flag in, in connection with happiness. Uh, Charlie Cranmer asks, is it true that the pursuit of happiness was changed from the original the pursuit of property? How did that work? Um, pro property is an alienable natural right. You can surrender it to government during the transition to the state of nature. Happiness, by contrast, is un alienable because you can't surrender your powers of reason and you can't allow anyone else to tell you or anyone else what to think. So that's why Jefferson gets the pursuit of happiness, not from John Locke's second treatise, but from Locke's essay concerning human understanding and the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers think of happiness as unalienable rather than alienable. And we also have a uh, great question about, is there a source from Hume's writing, appropriate and accessible for middle schoolers approaching the Constitution. What would it be? Linda Litton, a uh, great question. Um, uh, Dennis and Aaron have recommended Hume's essays, and I think I'll ask uh, you, Aaron, is there, there a particular essay that you would start with for the middle school students? And then, as we begin to uh, tie this together, give us a sense of Hume's influence on Hamilton's view ex of executive power in Federalist 85. Those are great questions there. Uh, as far as Hume's essays and uh, teaching middle schoolers, I'm, I really like Hume's that politics may be reduced to a science. And I mean, you get uh, there. I mean, Alexander Pope said uh, that government is best, which is best administered. And you have uh, Hume uh, uh, rebutting that and saying that the constitutional mach machinery is more important. Um, and uh, he has a, a great uh, set of essays on happiness, four essays on happiness that I would recommend. And we've been talking about happiness a little bit here. And Dennis started by saying that Hume was this, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a cheery guy. I mean, people like to have dinner parties with him, to have conversations with him. And in these four essays, Hume speaks about the, um, the ancient moralists. And he says there are some sentiments that seem to arise naturally in human affairs. And uh, he ties the Platonists with contemplation and the Stoics with action and the Epicureans with pleasure. And then he writes an essay called The Skeptic, uh, which is a response to these and argues, uh, as, as Hume will 
argue in a later essay that happiness consists in a balance of all these things, right? A little bit of contemplation, a little bit of action, a little bit of pleasure. And uh, I mean, I think that says a lot about who Hume is, uh, his perspective on happiness. And you have there this idea that um, there are various perspectives on happiness and uh, the pursuit of them re requires, you know, in Hume's mind, and also, I mean, you can see this in the Federalist Papers, you can see this in later interpreters of the American uh, political order, uh, right? there's a plurality of visions of happiness, and uh, there's a, a freedom there to per pursue that. We'll all be happier if we allow each other uh, to pursue uh, these uh, various life plans. But uh, but Hume said, I mean, he and he repeated in his works, you know, the aim of this moral inquiry is to promote, uh, to, to help delineate and promote our duties. And uh, and so I think that's right. I mean, the idea of happiness and, and virtue are, are closely tied together. Beautiful. And Linda Litvin says, middle schoolers love happiness and don't, don't we all? And what a great place to begin. Uh, learning about happiness from, from Hume. They are so accessible, which is why it's so such a great introduction for learners of all ages. Uh, Dennis, um, we're, as we begin to uh, bring this great discussion home, why was it that Hamilton was so attracted to Hume's notion of a strong monarch defending himself against legislative encroachments by handing out offices and... Uh, Jefferson called that a kind of corruption, but it was central to Hume's vision. And how well has it endured in the American context? Right. A number of British thinkers at this time worried about the, the system that the king used to essentially grease the wheels of politics, to use um, money as a, as a, a, a Le as leverage within Parliament. This is seen as corruption. The Whigs wanted to get rid of this. People like Jefferson saw this as uh, um, an enormous black mark on the British Constitution. People like Hume and Hamilton thought, you know, sometimes the wheels need to be greased, right? That politics, you can't stand too much on principle, that sometimes you need to bow to pragmatic considerations. This sounds I think, strange to the modern ear, that we, we tend to think of principles as almost automatically good things, right? To call a person principled, and maybe even especially a politician principled, is high praise, right? You have strong beliefs, you have the courage of your convictions, you're not just motivated by kind of, uh, you know, pragmatic political considerations. Hume thought that too much emphasis on principle was in fact a great danger, <laughs> a source of great ills in politics. Well, why would that be? Well, Hume worries that when people think that their views, their beliefs, their desires are justified by a principle, then they start to regard those who disagree with them as not just political opponents or as rivals, people who have different interests, but rather as somebody who's wrong, maybe even evil or impious, right? And so this is why Hume thinks that a politics of principle is apt to be a politics of, you know, fanaticism and zeal and ruinous conflict. That there, that there can be moderation, there can be compromise when it's just a matter of conflicting interests. Um, but it's a lot harder to do that when it's a matter of principle. And so again, this sounds very odd for a philosopher to condemn the intrusion of, of speculation, of, of principle into politics. Philosophers from Plato to the present have said, well, how can we use philosophy to guide politics? But this, in some ways, this ties together a lot of what we've been saying. As befits a skeptic like Hume, you know, he thinks it's wrongheaded, it's dangerous to, to appeal to some transcendent principle beyond the political world and expect that it's somehow going to solve all of our problems. So the alleged corruption of, of the, the parliament is sometimes just, you know, a necessary matter of what, what, what has, has to go on in politics. Uh, Indeed, a great uh, distillation of Hume's uh, skeptical vision. Um, Aaron, uh, there's a big topic and little time to address it, but in your closing thoughts, you talk about Hume's religious skepticism, the fact that he was attacked as a atheist, although you say he's better understood as an agnostic, and at the end of his career, he described himself as an Epicurean, as surprisingly did Jefferson. What can you say uh, to help our listeners understand Hume's 
spiritual views and their relationship to his politics? Uh, absolutely, great question. Um, I mean, Hume is, is uh, he wasn't uh, alive at the time of the English uh, civil wars, but the wars of religion, he, he, he uh, read the works of Bernard Mandeville and Pierre Bale, he read Hobbes, and so he knew of the, the violence, the extraordinary violence that occurred in these wars of religion. And uh, liberal political thought is in many ways derived uh, from this attempt to uh, lower the temperature of political discourse, to uh, to to not uh, allow um, you know an, an enthusiastic religious views to intrude upon public political discourse, and uh, at this time in the response to the religious wars, there was a kind of skepticism and uh, an Epicureanism that uh, arose, and Epicureanism was uh, known in the ancient world for. Uh, separating in politics, morals and politics from the providential order. It was more uh, empirical uh, in its approach. And so, uh, and, and Hume is, is someone who says in the, in the treatise uh, that experience is the only authority on which we can rely, and on which we can rely. Madison in Federalist Twenties calls uh, experience, the, experience the oracle of truth. And so this, there's this turn to make uh, Politics, I don't want to say less principled, but, you know, I mean, less philosophical or uh, certainly less ideological. Uh, and one thing I argue in, in, in my book is that uh, this attempt to make politics less philosophical required a lot of philosophical maneuvering. And, uh, and that's that's one thing I think I contribute with with this book is showing that, I mean, Hume for someone who wanted to uh, be more practical, perhaps, in, in politics, I mean, he he wrote a, a massive tome, uh, as you've mentioned, Jeff, on the understanding and the passions and morals. And, and I think in modern political thought, I mean, sometimes you know, in modern life, we take uh, for granted some of these big philosophical moves that were taken during the Enlightenment. Um, and uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons Hume remains this central central figure. I mean, he was ambitious. He wanted to be heard and he uh, was heard. And, and I do think that this skeptical Epicureanism that arose in the early modern and Enlightenment periods uh, was was present in Hume. But that's precisely, you know, like folks like Madison, they didn't accept uh, that moral and those moral and religious views So they looked at Hume's political views uh, and his thoughts on on uh, public opinion and reliance on experience and observation, uh, these, you know, producing a constitutional machinery, these are the things that they really took on board. Absolutely fascinating, so important to distinguish between the epistemology and the, and the politics, but to note that the framers took some of Hume and not all of it. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, Angela Coventry, who wasn't able to get back, but contributed so much to our discussion, as well as Dennis Rasmussen and Aaron Alexander Zubia. And to you, dear NCC friends, it's just so exciting to see your phenomenal questions and the fact that you're taking an hour out in the middle of your evening to learn about this important uh, topic of Hume and the founders. And of course, the way to keep the conversation going is to keep reading and to uh, read the Hume essays, starting with the essays on happiness, um, and to continue with more primary sources, and then the great books of our scholars today, uh, Dennis Rasmussen, Aaron Alexander Zubia, and Angela Coventry. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, friends, and look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Have a good night. Today's episode was produced by Tanea Tauber, Lana Ulrich, and Bill Pollack. It was engineered by David Stotts and Bill Pollack. Research was provided by Lana Ulrich, Samson Mastashare, Cooper Smith, and Yara Derese. We the People friends, I'm so excited. On February 13th, which is coming up, I am releasing my new book, The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. You heard about it during the Hume conversation, and I can't wait to share it with you. If you would like a signed book plate, and who wouldn't, email me at jrosen at constitutioncenter.org, and I would love to send it to you. Please recommend the show to friends, colleagues, or anyone anywhere who is hungry, is waiting, is eager for a weekly dose of constitutional and 
historical illumination and debate. Sign up for the newsletter, constitutioncenter.org forward slash connect. And remember always in your dreams and in your waking moments that the National Constitution Center remains a private nonprofit despite that inspiring congressional mandate. We get basically no government funds and we rely on your dedication and engagement. Support the mission by becoming a member at constitutioncenter.org forward slash membership or give a donation of any amount, $5, $10, Seventeen seventy-six dollars, whatever you like, to support the work, including the podcast. Maybe seventeen eighty-seven dollars. On behalf of the National Constitution Center, I'm Jeffrey Rosen.